And I, I have the privilege of introducing our guest today, Mark Ryan, um, who co-founded Public Work in Toronto, which is a landscape architecture and urban design studio that um, stresses the importance of, of intelligent growth of a, of a modern city. Um, and the firm's central question, as stated on their website, is how can every urban project, public or private, contribute to the quality of life and experience in the city? Um, a little bit about Mark. He received a Bachelor of Landscape Architecture at the University of Guelph in Ontario, um, after which he got a, landed a couple amazing jobs. And I think from what I've learned, his education and early career really marked by several amazing mentorships he had with our field's elite, um, which started with Rich Haig in Seattle. I think he knocked on his door sort of toward the end of his career and worked on projects with him in his basement um, at a time in his life when he had very little patience for projects that didn't inspire him. So I think learned a lot there. He came to Denver to work at Design Workshop with, um, with my dad, and that's where I met him when I was a kid. Um, and after that, he uh, received a Master's of Excellence in Architecture from the Rotterdam Institute, forgive my pronunciation. Um, and he started working at the internationally acclaimed West 8 firm under Adrian Gusa, also, forgive my pronunciation, another icon in the industry. Um, in 2009, they shipped him back to North America to open a West 8 office is that in Toronto? In, in, in Toronto, New York? Yeah, so they opened West State in North America and he worked on some major projects on this continent, including um, the uh, Governor's Island Park and Public Space Master Plan and Toronto's Central Waterfront Master Plan. Um, those alone accumulated 16 awards and acknowledgements. Uh, in 2012, with his business partner, Adam Nicklin, he started public work in the same city. And although not every project is in Toronto, they've spent a lot of time working there. Um, and much like Salt Lake City and Utah's urban centers, uh, they're facing massive, staggering uh, population growth rate. Um, public work sustained investment in local projects has elevated the quality of Toronto's urban systems and improved the connectivity of its public realm. This interest in the public realm has already benefited the growing population and surely will continue to do so. Um, all of us landscape designers and planners here in Utah should pay close attention as we reach the peak of explosive growth. Um, I'll mention a couple projects that I found um, that I found on their website briefly here. The Bent Way is a project in Toronto which activates about two kilometers of space under a highway and simultaneously connect seven neighborhoods for pedestrians and cyclists. The Midtown in Focus vision plan um, is, is a plan to double the Midtown neighborhood's green space to prepare it as a key growth hub in Toronto. Um, their Great Streets transformation is an effort to realize the importance of major urban streets and boulevards, um, not just as places to connect a city, but also as a runway for civic engagement, historical, and cultural engagement as well. Um, these are just three project I, projects I basically picked at random from their website, and they all fall under the umbrella of the downtown parks and public realm vision for Toronto, an audacious 50-year plan to enhance public space at all scales throughout the city's urban core. Public Works sees existing cities as landscapes, and their projects demonstrate all the opportunities this perspective offers. I see much of their work as an effort to reinstate a soul in a, in a shiny steel-clad city by re retexturing urban spaces with natural elements in really exciting ways, all while using the common ingredients that we all are familiar with, like grasses, trees, shrubs, and grading. The results are often a fantastic weave of the formal rectilinear shapes of a modern city coddled by organic form. I defy you to go to their website projects page and not find a project that you aren't inspired by or that makes you jealous that you didn't think of it 
I'm so excited. Please join me in welcoming Mark Ryan. Wow. Thank you for that. Yeah, that was beautiful. Wow. Use this if you want to use it. Thank you. Yeah. Sam, can you hear me? Oh, if, is this, does this work or is, we're just, yeah. okay. Sam, thank you. That was something. Um, uh, I'm, I'm really, um, really honored to be here um, and to sort of see Todd Johnson uh, and Craig is, is, and, and Sam in one room is just really amazing for me. As, as Sam said, I, I started my career in Denver working with Todd. So Todd was a mentor, one of my first early mentors. Um, yeah, in, in my career and really launched me into, I think, thinking about um, cities and landscapes as interwoven and, and, um, and, and as, as, you know, um, as full of, full of inspiration. So I want to talk a little bit um, about um, public work. Um, this is, as, as Sam said, this is our 10th year. We founded this office together with my partner, Adam Nicklin, in 2012. Um, and in some ways, the whole, um, my career arc has been somehow about coming back home. Um, the first 13 years of my practice were abroad. Um, but in founding public work, um, this, I really think of it as a kind of local practice um, and a way of engaging um, with a city at, uh, at, a, at a period of, of change. Toronto is a city that's sort of becoming a version of itself. It's yet to it's yet to finish its process, like all cities. It's it's endlessly uh, it's endlessly evolving. Um, but we were so fortunate enough to sort of come to this this city in a time of change. Um, and and as I worked for West Eight, um, we were uh, lucky enough to win a competition to work on the central waterfront in Toronto, which I was able to be a project leader on. And that's a picture of, of me with my partner Adam standing over one of the wave decks under construction, sort of in, sort of in a way out of our league uh, in terms of uh, the kind of construction. Uh, um, but but we, we learned so much um, in designing and delivering public spaces along the, the kind of foreshore of Toronto and the Inner Harbor um, that gave us a lot of experience and, and, and I think like a, a sense that, that things are possible in the city. Um, and, um, and that gave us the kind of hope that we could continue with the energy that was happening on the waterfront through this waterfront regeneration process that was taking place, inviting all international firms to kind of demonstrate the power of public space and the power of landscape leadership to kind of provoke change in a city. Um, so, yeah, as, as Sam said, our, our, our practice is really about um, finding the public dimension in the city and in the public realm. And so our, 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 our focus is on, on cities um, and how, um, how, they can, how they can be uh, landscape sensibility. And here's a picture of Toronto around um, about 20 years ago. Um, and um, I know a lot of you haven't perhaps visited Toronto, but welcome you to come check it out. It is constantly changing. Um, in a period of about 20 years, it, it looks like this. And this is already out of date. And, you know, at, uh, you know Toronto was marked by cranes. You would, just, you would just see the most cranes in North America at any given time in the last 15 years in Toronto. Um, and that kind of, you know, in a way, caught a lot of us by surprise. Um, it wasn't always like this. This is, a, this is the year I was born. And um, uh, at this time, this is sort of Toronto with this will, will to become a global city, but sort of without yet establishing its, uh, its kind of, its guts or its fabric. And there was, there was um, the city had a disposition that was sort of oriented to buildings at that time. And, and a particular obsession with one, um, the tower. My childhood, I remember like sort of loving the energy of cities and just wanting Toronto to become a big city. Um, and in a, in, in a relatively short amount of time, I think it's done so. And when I, come back to, when I came back to Toronto, um, the, the question was sort of what now? Now that, we've, now that we've established sort of the vitality of a, of a large city, a metropolis, um, 
what, what, what's the next sort of agenda? And, and the, uh, the topic of the public realm, I think, was one that had, had to kind of be discovered after they got to this point. It's almost like a, a retroactive, you know, thinking about the public realm and its role in cities and how important that balance of pub public, um, public space and built form uh, is to quality of life. And so our, um, our work sort of began by starting to look at the city itself, but also around its edges. Um, and, and in a way to start to reappreciate the kind of um, natural landscapes. This is the ravines of Toronto, which are just, just, just an amazing kind of uh, stretches of, of wilderness almost that enter through these valleys. These are carved by glaciers thousands of years ago. Um, and, and, and the sort of ring of islands around the inner bay of the harbor. Um, Toronto actually sort of forgets that it's surrounded by a landscape. And then, um, and even sort of to look around the edges of its, uh, sort of its, its, the edges of its core and to sort of remind ourselves how that kind of relationship from the, the core of the city to its, its edges could be strengthened. And that became kind of, like, uh, you know, I'd say like a, a kind of obsession in our office to start to think about how we could, work at, a, at scales that uh, try to look at the big picture, try to think strategically, try to create visions, uh, you know, at the, at the large scale, but also knowing and realizing that we wanted to build projects that were often enacted at, on sites that are very discrete, discrete and, and independent. Um, and so for that reason, our practice really tried to embrace this combination of urban design and landscape architecture as sort of as, 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 uh, as a fluid and integrated. And so I want to just reflect on, on, on 10 years of sort of working in that way in Toronto um, and, and, and some of the themes and, and projects that have kind of emerged and how we've been trying to engage in this city during this time and period of its growth. And one of those themes is really about sort of the, the landscapes that preceded the city. Um, uh, the kind of raw, you know, like original landscapes and many of them that have been lost or others that need their sort of to turn up the volume and see them in a new way. And one of our very first projects as an office was a public park um, at the former mouth of Garrison Creek where it emptied right into Lake Ontario, which you see on the left um, about uh, 300 years ago. Um, and on the right, you see that situated now with about 900 meters of fill out to the harbor, disconnected from its sort of origins. Um, and it's part of the National Historic Site uh, of Fort York, which was um, our, our uh, defense against the American invasion uh, in 1812. So uh, I come in peace today. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, so this is sort of this in incredibly changing context where oh, today we don't have any uh, clue of what was there before. Um, and coming up on its edges is a new community of, of 18,000 living vertically in high rises. Um, and there's no trace of this original promontory um, where this creek emptied out into the lake and no sense of how the fortification related to its broader landscape. Um, and this is a story, we saw this uh, this morning in Salt Lake. Um, uh, you know, the transformation of the watersheds of the city during the 20th century, which has just kind of evaporated most of the creeks and, and, um, and water systems in the core of the city. And so Garrison Creek, the park that this, uh, or the, the creek that this park is named after, can only be seen uh, in a sewer. So uh, the simple idea was uh, that here on a national historic site that's celebrating mi military history that we could add the dimension of a longer, a longer history, to, to not think in terms of 350 years, but to think more in 12,000 years, and to bring back an artifact of, of the original landscape, so that that could you know, help your kind of balance the interpretation of this place and its evolution. And so we found like anecdotal um, sketches um, from early settlers uh, in the 19th century, and we started to think about how that reconstruction um, could be reformed, the sort of sense of the bluff, the materialization of the bluff, using ancient techniques like rammed earth, um, and uh, to bring back also the kind of indigenous textures of the place, um, the, the biotope of the place, uh, which is actually a return to the kind of a Carolinian forest, um, uh, which also has a, a strong kind of adaptive role for thinking about climate change 
and, and uh, the raising, rising temperatures uh, in Toronto. Um, and we, we created a kind of, um, with this artifact of the promontory, we started to create vertically three distinct landscapes. A lowland where we daylight the creek, um, and, an, and then the upper promontory of dry green, mediated by these kind of raw slopes against, Sam, I love the way you put it, against this shiny, shiny glass towers to sort of, sort of return textures that we city to do something with this grade shift that we are, we, we are left with, this kind of four meter grade shift, but instead of smoothing out that transition to actually create this very strong landscape that could kind of mediate this, oh, excuse me, mediate this, um, mediate this divide. Hang on, so I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble here. So here's some glimpses of that of that um, that park, um, and and these kind of like raw, rugged edges, um, and the, and the connections of of, uh, of trails that are facilitated here. This file must be so big; it's slow. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm like. I'm, okay. Yeah, maybe I'll do that. Um, the next thing is, you know, in a in a growing city at the pace of Toronto right now, um, we 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 have the opportunity to create um, new kinds of public spaces um, in different places, and and sort of the, this um, th this is a project that uh, where a client is a private a private client, and we're creating a a park that bridges over the rail tracks at the core of our central station. And this is an area totally vacant of green space. And, um, and there's a chance to kind of in install this elevated kind of sky park right an amidst uh, a transit hub, um, a, new, uh, a new bus station, um, and uh, the kind of anchor of our subway system. And right, it's right next to uh, Canada's busiest intersection, which is at Front and Bay Street where 75,000 people are passing by in a, in a day. Um, and, um, and, and to start to create this kind of bridging landscape which offers um, out of, almost out of thin air a kind of a space of, of refuge, I, I, you could say above the tracks, uh, above, uh, above the bustle of the city, created by these big steel trusses. And it's, it's under construction now, currently. There's a kind of glimpse at, at it. Um, and the idea was that this space was completely different than the, f the sort of floor of the city. Um, that unlike, you know, the, this kind of Toronto has a sort of gray pavement kind of culture, especially this is part of an extension of the financial district. It's just all kind of gray granite. Um, and here was an opportunity to think differently about the kind of softness, the organic kind of feel of, uh, of a landscape. When you enter this space, you see green from another perspective because you enter from the south and from the north from another perspective to feel the material uh, of wood and softness. Um, and uh, that's kind of sort of just showing you kind of glimpses um, of recent construction that's sort of being built right now um, with these kind of really oversized, robust timber uh, uh, glue laminated CNC kind of benches that start to create these generous uh, points of gathering amidst, uh, amidst these planted areas all um, sort of floating above the rail tracks. So, so here's, um, Here's a very small park, less, less than an acre, um, but it was sort of also ve very important to think about how it could be activated um, with its disconnect from the, from the ground. So, the, so it's, it's taking on these roles of, of, of performance, um, of sort of oscillating seasonal, seasonal programming, including skating, um, and, and to facilitate a lot of that programming um, within the landscape, we've sort of tucked in a landform that also supports ports, uh, beverage, um, uh, maintenance, and, and washrooms. So, so this, this kind of this, this, this botanical hill also sort of houses all the rest of a sort of working programming uh, landscape. Um, and as you move from the building, building edges and into the park, you kind of emerge through uh, these, these thicker canopies of native trees um, with a, you know, a ground, ground, uh, ground plantings that are all about 
um, in, you know, bringing a, a sense of, of texture and biodiversity to this elevated, uh, elevated park. Um, and the climax experience, which we hope to, to, to see when it opens um, later in the year, is, is, um, is one of really like borrowing the landscape of the, of the of, of downtown and the skyline, to have a place where you kind of gain your orientation from this hub of transit that you can rise above to this quiet place um, with a survey over, over downtown. Um, I want to talk about all, an, an, the next project, which was really about how we imagine kind of new forms of nature uh, in, in small, pe small, small parcels of the city. And this is a project um, at the University of Toronto. This is um, Spadina Circle, one of the exceptions to the grid uh, of, of streets in Toronto. And it, it, it has a former... Um, an, an old haunted building that was uh, decrepit, uh, facing facing south, um, uh, and and then kind of like n no relation to the north, um, um, and and this project was really about allowing the circle to to be con to engage its context at all sides and to move sort of from its historic orientation. Um, uh, you know, due south to start to embrace the relationship to campus to the east. Um, and then, and then create a new kind of north and south, uh, south edge. And as a circle, it's a kind of it's a it's a landscape that's in, experienced in motion, um, which was really interesting. And also on a on a on a very small site, again, um, just over an acre, um, we were able to start try to choreograph an experience, especially for students like who need to get outside. And think and just the, the the idea that you could kind of revolve around this landscape, um, and, uh, and and kind of have a, a real sense of refreshment, um, and and a, and a kind of yeah new outlook to get away from the studio. So um, you know, with a very uh, modest budget, we were able to sort of like almost create two two strong identities that kind of play with the historic side, and then reinforce a completely different kind of northern, almost Jekyll and Hyde kind of situation. Um, the, 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 the systems that are, um, that are introduced from a landscape perspective are all about how you can communicate that to the students who will study landscape um, and to be able to read what's happening in the landscape, but also to create an experience of, uh, 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 of the, that's unique in the city. So this is sort of some views from that southern, very historic facade which was regenerated um, uh, of the kind of the native grasses um, that really have a kind of uh, kind of um, supportive role to the architecture. And as you kind of revolve, we're kind of going around the, the clock of, of this circle. As you evolve, there's sort of these quiet, more pastoral um, s settings for for reflection that kind of build and towards this uh, the new entrance plaza of the of the building right here. Um, and uh, again, with sort of a, the constraints of a, of, a, of a limited budget, the use of concrete, we, we tried to develop a kind of scoring pattern that would kind of try to elevate the, the quality and, and sort of texture of this place and using an agricultural technique of a barn, uh, barn engraving with these diamond saws um, to create, uh, you know, to add enrichment and texture um, all around uh, this kind of plate of concrete. And as you move to, from the towards the entrance, there's kind of inflections in the landforms that start to get a little more dramatic. And you move from that, those historical, very supportive grounds to actually these quite expressive landforms. Um, so like here you're, you're also seeing the building designed by Nader Tarani's office Nada, based in Boston, and this kind of interpretation of the architecture as a neo-Gothic, moving from a neo-Gothic building, and, uh, and, and, and so then these, these sort of landforms, a more experimental kind of climax happens in this corner, where we introduce uh, oh, what we often call a Darwin's Hill, which is sort of like a major inflection in, in the land, which is actually a pure balance, a nearly pure balance of cut fill, excavated terrain, from a lower uh, northern uh, northern terrace that's sunk in there and relates to the to the lower levels of the building, that is becomes a, a soil repository up um, in the north in the northeast quadrant of the site, and 
and, and this is sort of in, in some ways a very didactic uh, demonstration of moving land and land forming and shaping to create drama. Um, and, um, and so, you know, in all these cases, we sort of have, we share, share all the working drawings with the students so we can start to understand cut and fill um, construction de techniques in terms of reinforcing slopes. And, and the, uh, this particular landform, um, which, which um, uses mechanically stabilized earth walls and, um, and creates kind of tipped grass plains, which, um, which are south facing and, and include a bleacher that is, um, was un unfortunately value engineered and sort of awaiting funding, but, um, but has three for distinct sides that engage sort of the streetscape on, on one side, the plaza on the other, and the inner, um, the inner landscape on the other side. And here's a view of that inner slope, which becomes what was kind of imagined as an experimental um, uh, and the first experiment was simply to, to plant a taxonomy of trees, native trees that were approved by the city of Toronto for naturalization. And, and, and this would allow students who are you know, focused in their studios right up here to have a sense of uh, and, a, and a contact with the growth of, of trees and vegetation that they just don't usually get in the city. Um, and to see that, uh, that first experiment of how, how these trees uh, grow and they can follow their habit and structure and understand the, the um, uh, yeah, have a kind of instant walk to kind of refer to. Every, every slope is sort of calibrated to, um, to kind of also like become a kind of set of, um, of reference points for what does a three to one slope feel like? What does a two to one slope feel like? And, 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 and every, um, Every plant, tree planted ha is using different, different, um, uh, uh, different details, including structural soils, including silva cells, including different volumes of soil, so we can, students can track that growth over time and monitor the landscape. Um, and the slopes themselves become a kind of points of ongoing experiments as well, between um, slopes that have been planted um, with, with various techniques, including live staking, um, and others that have become uh, hosts for spontaneous vegetation. Um, and so we're, we're constantly allowing, almost like the, working with the faculty on, on kind of different maintenance regimes that like have this balance of care and, 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 and kind of uh, maintenance, extreme maintenance versus really raw and almost feral uh, conditions. And so here's at the top of the ring um, where the sunken, uh, sunken courtyard relates to the fabrication labs and you really sink below the city. This experience of kind of, you know, almost disconnect from the city versus the experience on the hill where you have this huge prospect. Um, and uh, it's been great since, um, you know, in the pandemic that, that this has been a space that actually has, has really kind of come and become an outdoor uh, learning space um, used, used. And the new dean has really been embracing this as a place for dialogue, which has been really exciting to see. Um, another dimension of, of the projects that we, I think has been kind of a turning point in our practice is starting to think about um, public spaces that are uh, deliberately, in a way, um, uh, not incomplete, but deliberately left with sort of a script that's that's more open um, to allow uh, to allow them to be kind of really um, thoughtfully created, but not feel finished, and to allow a sort of space where others would would add to them, um, and where programming um, could actually. So we were we were, um, this is the Bentway in Toronto, and you're looking at the Gardner Expressway one of the um, like 20th century's uh, kind of legacy of a, of a elevated highway that cuts through our downtown, separating the downtown from the, from the lake. And in this stretch, just under two kilometers, um, we were invited by um, Ken Greenberg, one of our city's legendary therapists, to come up with ideas of how, um, w what could live within this and in the undercroft of this of this structure, um, 
you know, what's interesting is this has been a symbol of division of neighborhoods, uh, of, of landscape systems, and it has the it it sits sort of within this constellation of about um, thirty thousand people living who actually have quite a generous access to green space, but don't have a sense of a kind of public center or, or a kind of city life that, 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 that centers these, these various communities. So that was the idea of the Bentway, that it in a way fills voids that aren't met by green spaces, traditional green spaces or traditional urban, urban plazas. Um, but the, uh, that, that, that there could be a kind of public realm of a different kind. Um, that we, you know, when, when looking at the original structure of the place, we started to really be fascinated by the cadence of these, these columns, which we call, our, we call bents, um, that start to make this feel like a space uh, on one hand of many, many individual rooms, um, but on the other hand have also an effect of like in, in these long stretches of feeling like singular monumental spaces. And, you know, in a, in a space like this, I mean, it's, uh, it's like Toronto got to a point where it had, st it could start to look at spaces that were less conventional and start to reimagine them with the energy of the population living around them, they, that they actually could become vital spaces. And it was interesting to think about the qualities of these kind of, today, these the sort of, every time we go to these, the space, we kind of recognize that it had actually a quality that defied what you might have imagined it. Um, it wasn't as dark and dank a space as you might think. It actually had these incredible um, light quality, and that that was the, that we almost wanted to like do as little as we could to kind of maintain the rawness of of this space, but also pick up on um, historical narratives that had been lost. And this is at the southern end of the same fortification that I showed in the first project, but how we could like build out uh, textures born out of this place, um, both the historic the historic uh, landscapes of, of, of the fort and cribbing walls that had been uncovered here, um, but also the, the structure, but can think about how it becomes human again um, and how we could evoke systems of the shoreline through vegetative uh, swaths, native grasses, and uh, in a way, above all, to think about how it becomes a connective element between neighborhoods, a way to move, uh, and a way of kind of bringing, bringing systems together. Um, here's that overlay of the shoreline which existed um, uh, before all that infill. And, and, in, and so the trail and the movement systems follow that, follow that shoreline. And to materialize that shoreline, we, we wanted to bring sort of an idea of, of salvage um, and reuse uh, in working with materials of the shoreline. And we were able to um, harvest uh, all these, these aggregates from a very special place in Toronto. This is the lead spit. This is a place where a lot of the detritus of, of construction in the city over the last uh, 60 years has been <laughs> processed and is actually kind of mixed on the shoreline. We were able to um, harvest uh, the last ship shipping uh, load from that place to use as mixes um, in making the, f the aggregate of the floors sort of work against the kind of coldness of the, of the concrete that existed in, in, the, in the expressway structure and bring kind of in, in a way um, a sense of the history of the city and a, and a kind of warmth in the past place needed. And so these become porous grounds, also start to um, reflect a kind of wayfinding idea and thinking about these bents as a kind of system of organization and, and, and as wayfinding. You know, with ideas of light um, and signage and, 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 thing, and, and things that were all around a kind of palette of um, robust, simple, and where possible, reflective uh, of light. This two kilometer stretch, you have a real diversity of experiences. Um, and that's sort of, sort, of, sort of, you know, one of the most important ideas to think about how to activate this place, not just in terms of like what it physically looks like, but actually how it performs and how it could uh, support, support life. Um, and in this, in, in, in some of the original ideas were actually to think about the pulse of the place and how programming could take advantage of these different adjacent conditions next to, through the, through the areas where there's direct uh, adjacency 
neighborhoods and through areas bounded by park and green space and through other areas that face uh, the, the tracks and other tough places. And in each case, sort of cater to welcoming community groups, welcoming new activities, programs, pathways double as skating uh, trails uh, in winter. So the injection of a, of a strong winter seasonal uh, program has been huge for this place. It immediately activated it um, and became one of the destinations in the city, which has been really exciting. Um, and the fleet of furniture that is, is really about you know, reconfiguring, allowing people to kind of move and, and situate um, uh, you know, where, wherever they would like to, to host sort of different, different configurations of gathering. Um, just to sort of uh, keep an informal quality to the place. And at wherever possible to start to layer, uh, layer public realm along with the kind of supportive community infrastructure necessary under here is our community meeting rooms, um, uh, storage facilities for programming and events, uh, green rooms for, for performers and public washrooms. some of the spaces uh, that welcome and interface with the streetscape. And, and I think one of the kind of central ideas has been also how the structure itself could be leveraged. How um, you know, this infrastructure built in the 20th, 20th century to support nothing but cars above could start to be leveraged for um, public life and programming below. And conceptually, there was an idea that that roof was almost became a kind of um, almost theatrical rigging, rigging, rigging apparatus. It was this sort of civic scaled equipment um, that could help foster kind of life below. And so um, we, you know, we developed almost a system of fixation points and how we would interface with the, with the structure. And one of the most interesting elements was these kind of friction hangers that would allow us to, to not penetrate the, the, the columns. So based on all this sort of strict transportation rules, um, but to allow um, us to hang kind of significant elements. And in thinking about that, we were working with our, these incredible local structural engineers called Blackwell Engineering to develop this friction hanger that could actually support a pedestrian bridge um, for, for a future phase. Um, so these are some of, the, um, some of the images of that that is still in progress. And with the ability, yeah, with the ability to hang a bridge, um, it kind of opens up the possibility of hanging all kinds of other artistic um, sculptural features um, and, and in a way inviting culture into the space. The skating rink, which follows the shoreline, um, is, is uh, also planned to expand so that you can skate that entire historic shoreline, um, culminating at the library um, and and the park. And these are the donors that made it happen. This was a, a big step in Toronto in terms of how uh, philanthropy can engage public realm. Um, this is more common, I think, in the, U in the US, but in, in Canada, this was a first. And this was this couple who donated $25 million to create this park with no strings attached whatsoever, no naming rights, you know, nothing. Um, and, um, and one of the, the the big contributions was not only making the place, but also using some of that money to seed um, a conservancy, um, not unlike the Central Park Conservancy, that would be responsible for the continuing programming and life of the space. And that was important in the dialogue in Toronto in terms of public space to sort of overcome the expectations that a park was delivered and activated simply by a parks department. Um, and, and I, you know, in, Again, this is, these are models that are more common in the U.S., but, but this, this was a sort of a, a first for, for Toronto. And the Conservancy has done uh, you know, amazing things. There's a constant kind of like array of things happening here. Um, this is Museum of the Moon, of the moon this sort of like hanging, hanging, hanging moon, which is just incredible. So it was really uh, like the spirit of, of also this place hosting things that couldn't necessarily be hosted in other environments was, is, is something sort of that the, that the conservancy is being really true to. Um, and, and it's exciting to see sort of how that schedule of, of engagements is, it continues to evolve. Um, and uh, 
tight relationships with community groups in the city, all across the city, who are invited to kind of use this space, take it over, and, and, and kind of sh share that sense of authorship about how, how this place continues to, to, to live and breathe. Um, and there was a real, like, a real emphasis on how the everyday pulse of the place could be sustained. Um, so there's sort of, there's this kind of constant sense that like there's, you know, you see the community yoga that's happening there on a regular basis. There's sort of all this kind of everyday mode. Um, and, uh, and there have been some really wonderful kind of spectacular moments. And this is a, a former classmate of mine from the Netherlands who's a, uh, a, a light artist who, who did the spectacular, Dan Rosegaard, who did the spectacular light installation across a kilometer of the space. Um, a big, a big turning point in our practice was um, when we were so fortunate to get um, a chance to kind of look at this, this uh, formally look at this condition in Toronto, this sort of um, deficit of public space amidst major growth, to take a look for, at a plan or a vision um, for the whole downtown core um, and to, in, in terms of its public, uh, public space um, and parks. And um, so with this kind of like, in, in a way, impossibility of making a central park or, or, um, or, or like a formal public space of, of that nature, we, we tried to really look again at the relationship between the core and the, of the built central city and its kind of green edges. Um, and we see a sharp kind of almost um, collision between the towers of the downtown core and our ravines. Um, it's, 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 it's almost the, the task of the next, the next 50 years is to start to you know, re-articulate these interfaces. And, um, and so we kind of began in thinking about how the morphologies of the glacial landscape in Toronto and then the colonial grid intersect and relate. Um, and, and so this, this diagram of these two systems started to inform a way of looking at the city um, almost um, Almost, almost squinting and starting to see the the landscapes, green spaces that do exist along this this almost circle around downtown, and think about the sixty or so projects that could start to weave those into one coherent network. And um, that network is interesting because it's it's really a mosaic of almost every landscape and eco ecological type, um, from uh, you know from already established public parks to sort of very um, near wild um, uh, ecological settings in the ravine and the, the lower valley. Um, but they also start to break out in this sort of interesting symbolic way in terms of the, our relationship to our, our river, the peninsula and, and islands that, which surround the bay, all completely the lost uh, creek system of Garrison Creek, which I talked about at the mouth of the Garrison with our first project, and how that stretches up to our um, the shores of an ancient glacial lake, Iroquois, uh, along the northern bluff. Um, and that in our minds that we come almost like, instead of imagining a, a central park or kind of core green space, that we could imagine actually a, a perimeter of green um, at a scale actually, you know, vastly larger than any park we, we ever had in the city. Um, but maybe not one that is experienced um, at once, but in, in, in fact, um, in, in, in many different ways. And the kind of counterpoint to that green system was, was a, a rethinking of the streets and the key streets within downtown. So there's sort of 12 key streets that we, look, we, we started to look at and the terrain that they take up in the public right of way is significant. Um, and by thinking about like, we, we, you know, we created kind of, um, conceptual ideas for each street and how they could transform their identity and the way they performed actually as public spaces rather than just transportation arteries and then how they deliver you to this edge became key. Um, a series of those streets also started to be elevated in terms of the, the role they could play as absorptive infrastructure, uh, processing water. And one of those key streets was University Avenue, which is one of our most ceremonial historic streets um, it has a, a kind of iconic central boulevard uh, 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 and landscape in its center, which is uh, absolutely vacant, unfortunately. And when we worked with 
with um, Gale Studio to do public life surveys. It was kind of proven these instincts that actually, you know, even at peak times, only two out of 100 people ever stopped in the space. Um, so in looking at uh, that, that thin line, this three acre uh, line of this central boulevard, we started to think about how we could actually reconfigure uh, some of the lanes of, trans of transportation movement, grow them and connect the civic city hall and the civic district to the north with our provincial legislature building and the University of Toronto, original historic campus, and how um, that street could actually play a role in creating a a kind of an ensemble of, of, green, of green spaces that included a, a linear park as a street. Um, and uh, that, that, that just in the public right away, we could create a nine acre park sort of that never existed. Um, and this kind of generated a conversation in the city, which you know, is, is, is nothing new, but it was just in Toronto, it was really important to, to start to think differently about the role of streets. Um, and not only streets themselves, but how streets start to join forces with rethinking the open space resources that we have. Um, and and that, that dialogue around university became a case that we started to develop with other neighborhoods and their associated green spaces. So we started to think about a series of almost park districts of existing neighborhoods and their, and their open spaces and how they could be woven closer together and how they could perform differently um, using streets as conduits that would, in this case, connect two revitalized existing spaces but start to create a kind of larger halo or effect or experience in the neighborhoods. And so there was, you know, there was a, about 10 of these districts and, that, and, that in, and then that included also then starting to think about some of the, uh, the real high density districts um, in, in the core and how we could start to think about new kinds of infrastructure that would bridge, in, in this case, our sunken rail, rail yards and create um, what was called Rail Deck Park, um, you know, which is, again, not something that we intended to be a near-term solution, but also to think about some of the long-term solutions when, um, when, um, when the, the, the real estate climate would allow this to happen, um, not unlike Hudson Yards, but this potential here at the very core to create a 21-acre uh, green space, um, something that the mayor got very excited about um, and, uh, uh, you know, has been a kind of an ongoing debate um, in the city about how a project of this magnitude and cost could be justified or, or, be, or be thought about. Um, and, uh, you know, the project sort of also got down to a layer of, of the finest grain, almost the confetti of laneways uh, um, and, and other sort of small, uh, small, small public parkettes, they're called in Toronto, these little neighborhood layer um, as a kind of also counterpoint to the larger moves. But something interesting happened um, when the Raptors won uh, their championship. Um, the celebration sort of ended up on University Avenue, that one of these streets that we you know, had, had been talking, talking about. Um, and it rekindled the conversation about, you know, like, where do we celebrate? Where do we gather? Where is our, where, you know, because these kinds of celebrations, they kind of almost suggest where, um, where your most important public spaces are or could be. And um, in a sort of similar um, setup to the Bentway, we had a, we were approached by a donor who was, uh, again, a very kind of engaged citizen who was fascinated by the University Avenue proposal that had been discussed. Um, but was not, um, but but we were, but we're not seeing any action on that on that front. As I said, the mayor got really interested in Rail Deck Park, a one and a half billion dollar enterprise, um, but sort of it had had not um, clued into the potential impact of University Avenue and a much um, swifter kind of uh, uh, delivery potential. So, um, so we were able. He helped uh, to. Uh, support a further investigation of University Avenue as a corridor and to start to think in the context, this happened during the pandemic, um, as we all, uh, you know, like kind of raise the dialogue about and the public, the public interest and, and need for access to, to nature and cities. Um, you know, of course, like uh, continuing the, the conversation about climate change and resilience and how this streetscape could perform in a totally different way. And again, um, 
highlighting as 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 now the central um, the central th uh, need to think about equity inclusion in our in our cities, and this is you know this is the place of protest, and so the the, the idea that at the top at the top of this uh, street is our provincial legislature, and then at the at the base is city hall, that this this could be a new system that would connect the two and be you know one of our kind of most most important symbolic landscapes, um, and the value proposition which is in, you know where where um, there was sort of political attention on a 1.6 billion dollar initiative versus what is relatively a lot cheaper and more accessible became um, a politically uh, sort of good timing. Um, and we've been continuing to now work um, with the task force with the mayor's office and, and the department heads to, to ac explore um, how we can make this happen, um, to really uh, think about just the simple transformation of nine and a half acres of publicly owned asphalt um, into uh, a 90 acre park. And the, you know, it's so interesting how the pandemic uh, took the existing condition that we had before into a new condition that uh, was created just uh, spontaneously during pandemic time when traffic was reduced and bike lanes were added. Um, the, the traffic flow was, it was, was reduced to two lanes in each direction and that opened up the possibility to to really think about how how we could continue coming out of the pandemic and out of, and, and, as an econ economic development scheme and to, to think differently about how the regeneration of this could happen um, without adding those extra lanes back. Um, and so uh, we've gotten you know, into detail about how now these, this interface um, with our provincial legislature there on the left and the campus on the right could actually be a kind of reg regeneration of an ind the indigenous landscape. This is the lost, um, another lost creek in the city that has been kind of, that is, is sort of lost in this, in this maze of, of uh, transportation infrastructure. Um, and, and the idea of like regenerating this, this system um, and expressing its performance as an ecological landscape and water management uh, 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 amenity. Uh, and so this is sort of before and this is after um, and then as, it move, as the street moves, moves south, it lands in our, our hospital uh, district, which is sort of is conceptually uh, rep being repositioned as a wellness district. Um, and this is where sort of four of our major hospitals have addresses, but don't have any interaction or common ground. And uh, moving further south towards our courthouse and opera house, these again, there are lost landscapes that no one visits that are actually significant. Uh, in size, uh, and and the proposal simply reconfigures trans, uh, the lanes to the west side and opens up um, these these new uh, these new green green spaces as public terrain. And here's our opera house currently sitting on uh, with a street sidewalk, um, and this is the potential new um, new uh, new square and plaza. All the while continuing movement flow just off the screen here in four lanes, um, consolidated. Uh, to the west side, so um, so this is now um, this is now sort of part of our template of of projects that would develop um, for TO Core. This project for for thinking about the sort of next fifty years of, of the city. And but for us as a as a studio, this is in a way this is our framework for our practice. We think of this sort of as how how we can continue to engage with our city, our home our hometown. Um, and, and start to think about how, you know, deeply how every project that we work on now has, a, has an aim that's larger than its own site, um, which was really, in, like, I think, like, important to our, our, uh, our thinking and, and to the kind of situation Toronto's in where it's, it's not about creating things from scratch, it's about actually kind of a second reading of the things we have and thinking about those resources connected to others. Um, and facilitating kind of new new relationships across the city. So this this is um, this is now kind of uh, um, the, what we're we're trying to work on, and it embodies sort of a I think a theme that that is central in our office that we look at the city as a landscape. We look at how the dynamics of of the, of, of the landscape can inform thinking about the city, and we really try to kind of operate as a holistic practice that embraces. Uh, you know, the human and natural dimensions. Um, 
that's where that's where I, I wanted to stop and thank you for thank you for to start off with I'm happy to start too yes Brent awesome lovely to see so many um, different designs and uses of cities and it brought back some nostalgia for me um, with some similar elements in Vancouver um, one of the things I wanted to ask about the pictures you've shown um, you had one that, that really represented winter and in a country that is predominantly frozen for at least half of the year. Um, and knowing that that's also, you know, to some extent, even for a lot of our students that are working in our Mountain West areas that are cold for an substantial amount of time, how, how do you guys um, develop formally with the, the organizations you're working with alternative seasonal plans outside of just the renderings that certainly need to be sold and discussed and you know are at the peak of use but there's so much other space that people need to explore in the winter as well instead of just their rooms so i'm curious how you approach that thanks um yeah that's it's always on our minds winter's always on our minds in some ways um we've had an interesting experience where we've been thinking a lot about outdoor comfort um, in terms of um, streetscape, approaches to streetscapes. And, and actually we were um, able to do some interesting research in a collaboration with Sidewalk Labs when they were doing a, a kind of experiment in Toronto, um, where we worked um, on developing a kind of, almost like a forestry strategy to a, a section of streetscape that was then tested you know, in, in a more detailed way through wind tunnels and uh, uh, in terms of, you know, s slowing down wind, mitigating microclimate and working together um, uh, with then thinking about the, the edges of buildings and, 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 uh, and, and thinking about less, like in this case, less about winter, but more about extending so shoulder seasons. Um, like for Canadians, winter is like something we just take on and partly it's about getting a good coat. Um, so, so it's almost like we don't have that sense. It's like how Dutch people are happy to go out in the rain. Um, so winter, in a way, um, we're pretty good at. It's actually the um, it's it's those edges that that I think we need to improve. So that's been a topic that we've been actually quite quite working a lot with, um, uh, and, and and I think is is um, it has a lot of potential, and and that goes along with sort of the theme of biodiversity because in thinking about some of those microclimates and how you know we get away from just sort of singular lines of, of monocultures of where we actually start to have swaths of, uh, of different plantings and this isn't necessarily for the core of the city but this is sort of as we we're working currently on on a street that basically delivers you to the river and and that's where we're actually starting to to play out some of these ideas so um, yeah, it's on our minds, but particularly the the shoulder season ideas in, in terms of microclimate. I was really impressed with the bent way. Um, all of your images showed lots of activation, lots of happy people, and and very well utilized. And you mentioned that you had worked really hard on programming for that, but what, are, are there any downsides? You know, I, one usually thinks of under those, those highways lacing through various cities as being the creepiest, scariest places to go. It's where crime happens, where homeless encampments crop up. Have there been issues like that um, in the Bentway and how has that maybe been addressed or mitigated? Is 
Thanks, yeah, it's a great question. And I guess um, the conservancy and I guess everyone involved kind of went in eyes wide open in terms of that, that kind of um, perception of space and, and, and the reality of what happens in urban conditions, harsh urban conditions. And it's become, yeah, it's become um, almost an ongoing dialogue. And that's sort of partly about how the outreach with the community uh, takes place. We're actually, you know, there are, there are populations who continue to live under the Gardner Expressway. And actually, um, as part of the, we continue to work with the Bentway, I'm thinking beyond just the, the sort of two kilometer stretch that we, we did in phase one, but thinking about the whole corridor. We're currently working on a, a kind of corridor wide plan where again, with the lens of, of equity inclusion and I think compassion really, we start to think about the city services um, the support services for these these communities um, and the, the you know people experiencing homelessness in in these areas so that that's becoming almost like a like a, a, a kind of role for the Bentway Conservancy in facilitating because they facilitate partnerships essentially community partnerships and so as as we think about the larger cor corridor that's top of mind and actually sort of solving in the next phase but yeah it continues to be um, kind of an urban reality. I, I can't say to you it's solved, but, but certainly um, uh, the, the mentality of the Bentway Conservancy is about like embracing and, and kind of navigating these urban realities. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's almost like um, it, it's, it's, not about dis it's not about moving that problem, it's actually about engaging that problem. And I think now the city sees um, you know, sees that like if it, it, it's almost like a, it becomes a, uh, uh, like if you can, if this can be solved, because we have shelters, we have city shelters that actually are kind of being pop-up shelters that are actually happening along, along this stretch. Um, and so to actually um, find a, a way to, to um, include that community as part of this and not displace it is, the, is, the, is completely the goal. So it's a work in progress. Thank you, that was a great presentation. Um, I uh, wanted to ask you the relationship that you had with the architects when you work for the University of Toronto, because you had a lot of landfill that was going right against the architecture and all that. I presume that you had a lot of, um, that you were involved in a sharing and relationship early in the process. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, that was um, that was really exciting um, to be th from the start. The architects were N Nader Tarani and his office were really uh, interested in how the landscape and the building could be fused. So that was almost a starting point. I think this is a school, a faculty, which is a school of architecture, a school of landscape, a school of urban design, and so the dean at the time, who was this, really was the dean's big kind of legacy project was uh, intent on the, the transformation being a, uh, you know, uh, an emblem for a way that doesn't just, that doesn't just only communicate architecture, but communicates, I think, urban design. The dean was from a background of urban design. So I think that, that set a tone for an idea that a project would, um, uh, would be would be blending and would would you know would be working urbanistically would be kind of interfacing with its context and so that I think was on the, the agenda from the start and yeah we we um, we had a very good very good collaborative working relationship and sculpting extending and thinking dramatically differently um, one thing I would say that's quite interesting is I don't think anyone totally uh, from the architectural side maybe totally imagined the magnitude of, of the scale and I think that that surprises continues to surprise people and one of my favorite moments is when you go on the, the tram the streetcar like around and 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 you're just faced with a um, you know 25 foot high wild feral <laughs> expression of of kind of uh, nature it's 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 a bit it's a bit surprising and so it's a it, it, it's an interest the, the, the architects were very open to the idea that this isn't a neutral a neutral ground for their building, but this is actually a, um, 
an, an interrelated uh, experience. So that was special, yeah. All right, we'll do one more. Uh-oh. <laughs> Look behind you. Look behind you. S that's seniority right there. <laughs> I agree with Carolyn that it's really inspiring to see because so many cities are just headed the other way. One one of the question I, I, questions I have, I think, relates to a lot of the innovative things you're doing to introduce plants, uh, you know, excessive grading, which normally you couldn't do, a whole variety of techniques. And, and I'm wondering, because it's so important to what you're doing, if somebody at Guelph or some other place, you've got a group of folks that are actually saying, here's the base data, here's what's happened over year one, year two, year three. They're keeping score of what's going on because so much of this is so innovative and is so enlightening or could be for other communities that are headed the wrong way that the more we know about it and the more you share it, I think the better off we're all going to be. So we've gone from Toronto to Saskatchewan and Alberta and <laughs> everywhere else to share that, uh, what's going on. I just wondered if there was anything like that. You talked about the wind tunnels and some of those studies, which I think are great. Uh, but A, you have on, on, on the biology and, and how things are doing, and B, w what good are they doing in terms of reducing heat, uh, taking up carbon? You know, you really start to put together some numbers that justify doing the kinds of things you're doing, not just for people and places, but for planet Earth, so. Thanks, Craig. Um, yeah, I mean, the fortunate, it's kind of a, very special to have a client who is a school of, of design, right? Because they, they are engaging this landscape. It's, it's almost like um, they're embracing the kind of pedagogy of, of this space, and they do continue to analyze and document. They use it as their grounds for experimentation. Um, so we hope to see some maybe formalization of that. But you're absolutely right. We have to, we have to be, we have to be looking at those metrics because, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's the only way. I just want to say thanks for doing what you're doing and for sharing. Oh. This is this is pretty innovative. That's great. Nice Thank you so much. Let's give them another round of applause.